On the 18th day of October, Halloween gave to me 18 zombie swatting, 17 Kegner screeching, 16 flying engines, 15 workplace accidents, 14 logs of bouncing, 13 planes exploding, 12 zombie soldiers, 11 angels wrestling, 10 ghostly hitchhikers, 9 basement clowns, 8 vampire cruises, 7 silent heroes, 6 prequel bloodstones, 5 diabolical fledglings, 4 vampire pianists, 3 dead professors, 2 Michelle actresses, and a radu drooling something bloody. Hey everyone, welcome back to the 31 Days of Halloween Celebration. I am your host for these proceedings, Bo, and I am a movie-holic. Uh, I am excited to be bringing you yet another episode. Here it is. Uh, like, less than two weeks from today, Halloween will be over, and that's a real bummer. But such is the nature of time, right? It only moves one way, uh, except in time travel horror movies. And other time travel movies. I, I'm just co-opting the time travel horror movie, of which there are precious few. Uh, but we'll talk about that another day. This has nothing to do with any of that. This is VHS 85, a recent Shudder release, where uh, we are extending the VHS franchise. I, I toyed with the idea of doing the whole thing, but we've done some of these before. And we've done some of them on Found Footage Fool and other places. So, I didn't feel like there was a need to go back and revisit the whole series. Also, this is not a series of movies that I hold near and dear. Uh, I think they're okay. And VHS 85, I think, is a reasonably good entry. But I'm not... Like, I could assemble one great anthology from all of the VHS movies and it would run about two hours and it would be the best of everything. And one of my problems I think with these VHS movies is that they run almost two hours. Like, I, you know, we've talked about this before. A good horror movie should be 90 minutes long. I know it's an anthology and that we're dealing with, you know, the, like 15, 20 minute short films. I don't care. I want this to be 90 minutes. This this feels really long and maybe it's because I don't, I, I, I don't respond as well to the VHS movies and that is my fault. I take that as uh, something that is on me as a human being and an entity and a, a sentient life on this planet. But let's, uh, let's do the only thing we can do with something like this and kind of take it piece by piece. And, you know, if you've never seen a VHS movie before, the premise is, hey, this is a videotape that somebody found. In this case, something that clearly got taped over because you see these segments, but in between uh, is a documentary that you're getting bits and pieces of. And and we'll get to that in a minute. So it starts with, with said documentary. And it's a, a team of scientists that are working on this like lump of goo that's a, a shapeshifter that they call Rory. And we just get the setup there, and then we jump to our first segment, which is called No Wake, uh, written and directed by Mike P. Nelson. No, not the guy from Rift Tracks and Mystery Science Theater. This is a different Mike P. Nelson, who uh, probably is a, a fine individual, but not the guy who brought me hours and hours of entertainment uh, with with the uh, various movie riffing uh, properties. No, this is the guy what made that recent Wrong Turn remake, which I don't think is great, but it's interesting. It does something different with the premise, which is something. And then a movie called The Domestics, which I've always meant to see, and, and then I did. Uh, so, sorry about that. At any rate... His segment, No Wake, is about a bunch of uh, friends who are going to this lake that is marked No Swimming. And they kind of ignore that and go swimming anyway. And they have, uh, you know, this big ski trip uh, where they're water skiing and whatnot. And then all of a sudden there is a sniper. Oh my goodness. A sniper killing them left and right. Uh, shooting them in the boat. Shooting them in the water. Uh, murdering them before... They can make it back to shore. 
And the end of the segment, which is over long, if you ask me, is them kind of waking up and be like, hey, we're not dead, although we should be because some of us are missing parts of our faces and, and we have holes clearly blown through us. And it's like, oh, there is something about the water that makes us zombies, even though we don't want to, you know, eat brains or anything, but we're, we can't be killed. And there's a, a pretty nice bit of effects work with a woman who's at like the lower part of her face was shot off. And there's a moment I like where one of her friends is like, oh, honey, don't look. You look fine. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, you know, it's just tongue lolling uh, onto her chest. That's pretty good. Uh, I wish there were more of that stuff. But anyway, they decide, well, what are we going to do if we can't die? We can't, you know, go back to our lives looking like this uh, on account of being horribly mutilated and grotesque. So they decide that they are going to exact some kind of revenge. And that's the end of the segment, which is deeply unsatisfying for a first segment in your VHS movie. Then we go back to our Toby story. Uh, or Rory story, which is called Total Copy is the name of it. And we just get uh, a little bit of backstory. Like Roy was found and, uh, somewhere on top of a butte and, and brought to this university. Uh, there's a guy named Dr. Spratling who is studying this thing. And they're trying to like teach Rory about humanity by showing him a bunch of television shows. And Rory seems to really like the exercise videos. Uh, like, you know, aerobics shows and whatnot. And Rory, um, or Dr. Spratling, wants to communicate with Rory and figure out, like, what he is, where did he come from, that kind of thing. Then you get to the second proper segment, which is called God of Death, which is a pretty routine... Hey, there's been an earthquake. We're going to go for safety. It's a bunch of people in a building going underground for safety. And they run across a temple to the Aztec god, McLean, McLean. And, you know, there's human sacrifice as the god demands uh, worshipers and sacrifice. And the lady, what was running down in the halls also... She becomes a worshiper immediately. And the last thing you see is a news reporter that's like, you know, oh, the, today is September 19th and the, the world will never be the same after today. Wink, wink. And you're like, I get it because of the whole God of death and all. That's, that's all right. And it's okay. Again, overly long. It takes a while to get to the point. Uh, but it's, it's kind of fine. It, it's a totally fine segment. Then you get to another interlude. Where uh, this time you see that Rory is able to very vaguely imitate human uh, appearance. And they cut to a, a person who worked on the team who has since quit and is like, yeah, as soon as we figured out that Rory could shapeshift, we should have done something different because things did not go well from there. Um, so then you get to a segment called Techno God. And Techno God is uh, directed by Natasha Kermani, um, who did uh, a movie called Imitation Girl and Lucky, uh, which was not a movie that I responded to great. And, oh, worth, worth mentioning, uh, Gigi Saul Guerrero is um, the writer and director of God of Death. She also did... Uh, La Quinceanera and did episodes of The Purge and did an anthology horror series called Into the Dark. Um, so that's her bona fides, uh, N Natasha Kermani, uh, we just talked about. And then we'll get to the others in a minute. And anyway, so this is like a performance art piece somewhere one presumes in New York City as a woman is doing... Uh, a bit about how technology is going to replace our God. And she's doing this whole, like, let's worship our new God technology. And basically pulls out an Oculus, uh, like our meta quest device where she straps this thing onto her head and has her gloves 
uh, so she can interact with this virtual reality. And sure enough, as she's you know making this scene of conjuring this techno god, it appears and roughs her up and throws her around the stage and murders her. And at the end, one of her assistants comes up to try to help her and rips off the helmet. And sure enough, her face has been like merged with the headset. So now she just has eyes on stalks and, and whatnot. Uh, I don't think this is particularly good. But the one thing I will say for it is that it's short. And so it doesn't stick around too long. It kind of does its thing and gets out. And I wish that other segments in this VHS 85 film uh, had the same philosophy. But they don't. I, 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 the less gore thing is kind of fun. But it just feels like one of those things like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah technology will destroy us. Got it. You're not bringing anything new to the table uh, on this one, I'm afraid. Then we have another interlude, and this time we learn that Rory is able to extend this, like, pseudopod that they call a feeler, this tentacle that comes out of his body. Uh, great. And then we go back to um, a story called Ambrosia, also written and directed by Mike P. Nelson, because it turns out that this is of a piece with No Wake. And it's a woman celebrating uh, what you think is like a birthday or even a quinceanera or something like that, like a Sweet 16 party. And instead, it turns out that this is a celebration her family does. And as part of the coming of age, they have to murder seven people. And she is the one who was murdering all the people in No Wake. She was the one shooting them on the boat and on, on the land and whatnot. And there's a bit where her younger brother, I think, is given a water gun that he uses to to squirt the main character with, Ruth. And anyway, as they're having this, you know, Sweet 16 celebration of murder where she's like, yep, uh, now that I've murdered all these people, I'm officially come of age. We can all uh, go on with our lives as, and I'm an official part of the family and all. Um, the police show up and start surrounding the place. And the as it happens, the survivors are, you know, in quote survivors, the non-brain-eating zombies created in No Wake have tracked her down, called the police, and her family, in maybe my favorite part of the whole thing, her family's like, well, we always knew this day would come. Everybody, arm up. And they've all got like machine guns and Uzis and pistols and are just not going to be taken alive. And so the police come in, they're shooting the place up. She gets shot in the head, but doesn't die. And the reason that she doesn't die is because she got squirted with the water from the lake. And that was the plan all along is to make her undead. One presumes so she can face justice, I guess. But, yeah, uh, so that's the end of that. And uh, a little, again, overlong, but one of the better segments, for sure, Ambrosia is. And then we get another interlude with Rory and the gang. And um, they've decided that Rory can see through this one-way mirror that they're using to observe him. And... Um, and, and Dr. Spratling is like, oh, this is a great thing because we're getting closer and closer to a point where we can communicate with Rory and they cut back to the person who, you know, no longer works there is like, you know, Spratling didn't deserve what happened to him, but he kind of brought it on himself. And, uh, I'm more sympathetic to the people that, you know, were just there doing a job when Spratling fucked all this up, cut to the final segment proper which is called Dream Kill, Kill, directed by Scott Derrickson, who did, you know, Exorcism of Emily Rose and Sinister and The Black Phone uh, recently. And you can tell this is from, like, a real deal big budget filmmaker because this feels like a real deal big budget kind of short film. And it's probably the best of the bunch, even though I still feel like it is over long and but the premise is that there's a kid who has dreams that foretell of murder and they show up on his videotapes which he is dropping in the mail and sending to the police 
And the police get them and are like, well, this murder hasn't happened yet. So, you know, it, it's this kind of semi-complicated thing of the VHS tapes are recording this kid's dreams, which are, you know, uh, premonitions of murder. And he's sending that to the police. And they finally track the kid down and you realize that, oh, this is actually the son of one of the cops investigating this and is kind of a weirdo goth kid. And, you know, they're trying to stop another murder. They don't. And the murder stuff is pretty good. Like the, uh, you know, from the guy who did Sinister, a found footage POV murder it turns out is pretty effective. And that stuff is pretty good and violent and gory and all the stuff that you want it to be in a movie like this. And, you know, I, I guess I won't spoil this for you of like, oh, it turns out that you know, we knew the killer all along and that kind of thing. And it's pretty good. Like this feels like a short film. I don't think it's a, a great short film, but pretty good and, and very gory. And of everything in the, in VHS 85, it is the thing I can point to and be like, Oh, this belongs on a good, like horror movie anthology film. And the rest of it, eh, maybe not so much. And so that's pretty good. And then you get to uh, the very end of things, which is the, the payoff of the interlude where Rory, of course, breaks out and just murders everybody. And there's a final gag where Rory is using his pseudopods to make the dead bodies work out in the way that he has seen on television. So, yeah, that's kind of kind of a fun little punchline. Um, but that's it. And, and that's all of VHS 85. And I w wanted to cover it because I've covered some of the other VHS movies before, and I'm always interested what they do with it and who they pick for, uh, their, their, uh, lineup of directors and creators. And last year had some pretty good stuff this year. Eh, uh, other than the Scott Derrickson one, I felt like, yeah, you can kind of keep all this. Uh, I would not necessarily recommend it, but also it's not awful. It's just not terribly inspired and not terribly, not terribly entertaining, I guess, at the end of the day. Uh, the effects are kind of fun. Uh, it, it feels a little less, you know, sloppy and digital like some of the years past, although that's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, of the entries... Like I said, the Scott Derrickson one is is really good. That No Wake Am Ambrosia one from Mike Nelson is pretty okay, if a little too long. Uh, but uh, all in all, VHS 85, real mixed bag, mostly un uh, like unexciting, I would say, although there are some moments. Uh, so, you know, if you like these kinds of movies, let your conscience be your guide. I did not have a ton of fun with it. I wish I'd had more fun with it. I wish this was a more fun entry. I wish it were a little more bonkers. Last year felt a little unhinged and crazy. And for all its faults, I would take that over this, which felt much more routine and safe. There didn't... Uh, nothing I was watching felt like I was in the hands of filmmakers who were dangerous. And I think you kind of want that from a short film. You want to feel... Either like a complete command of, of filmmaking or you want to feel like you're going to see something you maybe haven't seen before and maybe even something you shouldn't see. And VHS 85 never quite gets to those heights. So, uh, all right, that is it for our 18th day of uh, October uh, on a uh, delightful October Wednesday. I will be back tomorrow with another reasonably new movie and we'll talk more about that then. Uh, in the meantime, have yourself a great spooky day. Enjoy yourselves out there. Enjoy the Halloween season. And I will see you right back here tomorrow for another 31 days of Halloween. See you then.